broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, can you guys hear me? Hear me? Wow, this is uh this is totally bizarre. This is totally what? Yes? Jennifer, uh Jennifer, can you hear us? Really? Jennifer, you can hear me. Okay. Can you hear you, uh, mom, anyone mom. else? Oh, well they can hear us. If you okay, just started, else, please uh, just type in something, you know, the, in the audience, type in something, let us know if you can hear us. Somehow we can't hear each other. I can't hear the other, uh, I can't hear the other people. Uh, Yankee, can you say something? Um, or Becky, can you say something? See whether uh, they can hear you guys. Hey guys, if you hear any of us, just... Um, just just type in the name uh who you are hearing. Okay. Ralph, you can hear. Um Robbie, you say you, you uh hear a lot of um reverb. Uh okay. Do you hear um do you hear Yankee or Becky? Look, I uh, no, okay. Oh my goodness, I don't want this to my one person show today. I I have these I need these helpers. <laughs> okay. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm glad that you guys can still hear me, so uh I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead with uh with my story. And then I'm gonna uh, turn the uh, uh, the presenter, you know, the the computer to them, to Becky and Yankee, and hopefully, you know, when I give them the power, uh, you will be able uh, to hear them. Oh, okay. So Stephanie said that uh, she can also hear uh, Rebecca. So uh, so Becky, you and I are good. So this may be the Women's Day today. <laughs> Okay. Uh. Well, with that, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. Uh, I'm going to get started with our uh, with our chat today. No, Yankee and Kevin and um, Erfan, don't go away. <laughs> Becky, can you send them an email? Just ask them. Uh, ask those three guys to come back. Okay. So are we, uh, thank you guys for the feedback. Are we uh, showing my uh, screen? Oh, Stephanie, you're a godsend. Oh, great. So um, what I wanna share you guys today you know, uh, we have this, of course we have this, um, I mean, this is, this is the, uh, uh, a big elephant in the room. This is a big elephant in the room that, uh, that we can't, uh, ignore. So actually not only in East Texas, uh, can you guys see the screen? Uh, this, uh, uh, it's an article, it's an article, uh, in Texas Tribune and the title says, um, the title says, in East Texas, thousands of Easter lilies uh, with no place to go. So this is this is a really sad story. Um, basically, you know, these Easter lilies were uh, popped up uh, actually last uh, December. Basically, the, the Easter lily growing schedule, you know, it takes a long time, uh, you know, from December. I remember that's when I popped it up, the Easter lilies, and then they grow all the way and then they you know they're on sale uh during Easter. But this year, uh because of COVID nineteen and because so many uh churches 
are closed to slow the uh, the spread of the new coronavirus. Most of these uh, never, uh, you know, most of these lilies never leave the greenhouse. And and also, you know, we know that um, uh, not only Easter lilies uh, think about, you know, the, the 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 huge holiday that's coming up. The huge holiday that's coming up. Um, huge ho- uh, Mother's Day. Mother's Day, um, uh, you know, and I, I just called a, a local uh, greenhouse grower. You know, he's got a full greenhouse of beautiful hydrangeas, you know, beautiful hydrangeas in his greenhouse, a red and pink and blue, uh, just with no no place to go. It's it's similar situation. It's very similar situation. And um, and you know, as a, as a person, as a person, as a plant person, I I don't know what to do. I don't. Uh, I mean, um, what we can do. And yesterday I had this talk with uh, Dr. Kevin Ong. Um, as, you know, what, you know, what can we do? Um, so today uh, I'm gonna tell. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you uh, a story. Uh, a story that I just heard, uh, a story that I just heard uh, on NPR the other day, and I, I hope that this has, uh, you know, have this has some relevance to the uh, to our situation. This is this is kind of like a, a a story from other from other uh, industry, not necessarily in green industry. But I think this may give us some um, give some give us some hint, you know, what we can do to help our own industry. The uh, the hair product it's it's interesting, you know. When I heard this, I thought that was that had nothing to do with us. But then I was like, you know, maybe we could learn something from this hair product entrepreneur that she found a way to keep her business afloat. So very similar to the church closing, you know, not buying uh, Easter lilies and other things. The hair salons, a lot of the hair salons were um, were closed. A lot of hair salons are are, are closed, and basically, you know, um, and think about the hair salons that are closed, and this this uh, you know this his this person is a supplier. I think she has like 29 or uh, employees or something. You know, she supplies to these hair salons. She she's a supplier to these hair salons. When these hair salons are closed due to social distancing, I mean, what's she gonna do to what's she gonna do to um, about her products? So she instantly went to the thinker mode. She instantly went to the thinker mode. Let's see uh, what kind of thinker mode. That she's thinking. So this is what the, she was thinking. She was like, "Okay, um, can we just directly sell? You know, start selling directly to consumers. You know, so she, first, this is what she want to do. She was like, well, I'm gonna uh, start selling directly to consumers. Salons weren't buying anymore, and second, she needs a way to advertise to those consumers." And the thing is, um, the people are at work, you know, at home, but, you know, the working would just have to be digital and they still um, have to look presentable in a way. So they still need to, you know, look professional installed in a lot of cases. So that's when they thought about, okay, you know, all the stylists, all the salon stylists that she has worked with are her loyal uh, clients. What if, what if? What if these uh, uh, stylists create videos, you know, home hair care videos and post them on Facebook and on any kind of uh, social media? And then their client will watch them and then probably share them. And that way, you know, um, then they will have a, uh, you know, they could have a, a way around to sell directly to consumers. So actually these uh these short videos on different processes you know uh, even just from detangling hair i know we're probably getting into too much of the details here but the bottom line is um i 
at the end of, you know, those salon uh, stylists, when they, after they create the video, you know, at the end of the tutorial, the stylist will give a code and the customers will use the code to get a discount at Asian website. Asian is this uh, entrepreneur's um, product line. And then the Asian will know from the code which stylist has sent the cu uh, customer and the stylist will get a cut out of the sales. Um, so in this way, you know, her stylist, so she has uh, more than 20 stylists from all across the country. They have made videos and shared on the uh, uh, social media about Asian's product. So the, on sale, uh, the online sale in consumer products, uh, which Asian, this entrepreneur is, you know, supplying has jumped tremendously. And at the same time, you know, is also helping the stylist his uh, old customers, uh, you know, to stay float at least a little bit. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, this is, this is my story of the day. This is one of the story that, that I have in, uh, to share with you all today. And the second story is, uh, is about uh, one Chinese uh, restaurant. It's about one Chinese restaurant. What, Becky, why are you so excited? <laughs> I bet you like Chinese food, don't you? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you you all remember COVID nineteen was first kind of like burst into the the world new stage uh, right before Chinese New Year, right before Chinese New Year. Um, Chinese New Year. Um, Chinese New Year is a lot similar to the Christmas here. In case y'all don't know, in the sense that Everything is closed. Listen to this. You know, everything is closed. Just like in the United States during the Christmas time, everything is closed except Chinese restaurants. Get it? <laughs> everything is closed except the Chinese restaurant. So that's like uh, that's like one big time. You know that everything else is closed but Chinese restaurant, and the Chinese restaurant are set ready. They get all their supplies. They got all their supplies. They get everything ready to to you know to prepare for their biggest event, their biggest feast, carnival of the year. And suddenly everything closed. I mean everything's closed. Everything shut down. So a lot of the uh, uh, restaurant owners. Basically, a lot of restaurant owners, they're, they're end up with all the materials. Think about all the meat, all the vegetable, everything, all the food materials that they have prepared for Chinese New Year. Okay, Chinese New Year, although it's Chinese New Year and maybe just one day, but actually we celebrate for like two, more than two weeks, a whole 15 days. For a whole 15 days, you know, you're not supposed to cook and stuff like that. So for a whole 15 days, that I mean, these uh, these Chinese restaurants in China, they are prepared for this big event. What happened? That they just I mean, you know, it's just keep losing money. In the as days goes on, they keep losing money. And one Chinese restaurant, one Chinese restaurant, and actually more than one, but multiple, they found a way. They uh, they were thinking, okay, people still get to eat. People still need to eat what can i do how what can i do uh how you know oh i have all this food i have all this food i have all this material what can i do so he thought about the nurses he thought about the doctors he thought about the policemen he thought about all those people volunteer to keep order during this time so they started to deliver food. They started to deliver food for free to all these frontline fighters. And then what happened? Of course, we have social media. You know, uh, we have social media and people start, all these nurses, all these front end, they, you know, uh, um, the frontline fighters, they start to uh, share their story of this restaurant. And then, well, then the orders. So, so, so he was he was just really just doing it from his good heart. He was trying to help, you know, instead of to let his uh, food the the food materials go into waste, he was gonna help 
those who are helping the mass. So that way, uh, I mean, he he was definitely operating at a loss, you know, by continuing cooking without getting paid, by delivering food for free without getting paid. But at the end, he got so many good words. He got so many good lawyer, uh, loyal um, customers. Uh, just, just it's like a pyramid. It just exploded. Um, so um, that's I, well. I in my preview, I said I'm only going to share two stories, but I have a uh, I have a uh, oh oh. I have a bonus. I have a bonus story here. Uh, can you guys see my screen? I hope you can see my screen, right? Okay. So what is my bonus story? There's one time I bought a USB from Custom USB, and uh, and you can see the this this uh, these uh, uh, this email that I've been getting. You know. March 19th, it's still about, you know, hey, you know, we want to let you know that we're still open. Uh, March 25th, hey, you know, we're offering this free stand preload. You know, it's, it's you know, free uh, service to you all. This is what we have, you know, and stuff. On the uh, April the 2nd, uh, hey, we have, you know, send the curriculum home. We have uh, free shipping and two gigabyte preloads. And again, on uh, February 2nd, you know, uh, bring, uh, bring the brand home, you know, two gigs. So it's still that. And then on the 7th, five days later, five days later, um, the tone changed. It's nothing about USB. If you look at if you look at my email, you know we're leveraging 15 years of product sourcing expertise and our quality control to help our customers and partners to acquire much needed, genuine, personal protective equipment at best possible prices throughout this COVID-19 crisis. And, and I was like, what? This is like you know this is like a 360 degree uh, change. From a custom USB to uh, to PPE, wow! So you know, not like so many other uh, uh, Chinese factories that they they only uh, you know provide K995, so that's the Chinese standards, and they they also provide N95, so that's the that's the US uh, CDC uh, standards, and then you know, and then on Tuesday again, you know, and they even have publication and stuff, so. You can see that from February second, still doing the um, still doing the USB, you know, free shipping, two gig preload, and to the seventh, you know, there's nothing about custom USB. It's all about PPE. I was like, wow, that's uh, I mean, that's not one hundred. Well, yeah, that's one hundred eighty. Sorry, my math. Uh, my math was a little. That was a hundred eighty degree turn. Oh. So these just three stories, um, um, I hope that, you know, um, that we all learn uh, something uh, that could be useful from these, uh, from these stories. So with that, uh, who's ready? Who's, raise your hand. Becky or uh, Becky or <laughs> Becky, Yankee. Okay, Becky, you're ready. Okay, great. So I'm going <laughs> to thank you for raising your hand. I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay. I'm going to make you the presenter. Oh. Okay, guys, can you guys Can you all hear Becky? Can you all hear the real Becky? Okay, Becky, uh, Stephanie said that she can't hear you. Jennifer said that she can't hear you either. Maybe you're not the real Becky Grubbs. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to try someone else. I'm going to try the real Becky. <laughs> 
fall. I'm gonna try you. So Jennifer and Stephanie, can you hear? Oh, I can see uh I can see uh I can see Airfonts uh I can see Airfonts uh uh Airphone, you're self self muted. Airphone, you're self muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay. Check check. check. Oh. <laughs> okay, woo, 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 woo. okay, airphone is good. All right, yes. y'all can hear me. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had so much to say uh, during your part, Mung Mung. So if you could just redo that. Uh, I had so many like little things to throw in. Uh... <laughs> oh. You know what? I'm going right. to eat my Chinese lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so I had a couple things I want to discuss kind of quick. One was um, mention of Coryopsis beetle. So uh, this is a type of a leaf beetle that can feed on tick seed or coreopsis that uh, we've had some nursery growers that they'll sometimes produce it. Nice little pollinator, pollinating plant and wildflower. And this beetle uh, is thought to have maybe originally, oh, that shrimp looks good. That, that is a type of arthropod, which insects are also arthropods. So why aren't we all eating insects? Am I right? Anyway, getting back on topic at hand. Um, so this Coryopsis beetle was thought to originally have been from Southeast uh, the U.S., uh, thought anyway, but is just increasingly starting to become more of a problem. So it seems like it might be a, a range expansion. And uh, what, what's kind of concerning about this particular pest is that it can eat a plant uh, down to the ground. So whereas some other beetles, you know, might cause some chewing damage, but but your plant is still okay. In this case. Um, no control can result in a complete death of the plant. So you kind of need to take some control measures uh, into consideration. And so, um, you know, it's similar to, if you're considering, you know, how to, how to manage this, especially in a nursery type setting, you might consider uh, using a similar type of insecticide to what you'd use uh, if you're trying to manage the Colorado potato beetle or something like the striped or spotted cucumber beetle, because they're very similar in terms of the feeding strategy both as adults and as larvae, they feed on the leaves. And I did have some nice photos of the larvae myself, but unfortunately it's on my uh, work computer and I, I couldn't access it from here. But um, so things like, you know, there, there is a trial, I actually want to pull up. I like to always refer to data, just uh, that way I'm not hopefully getting myself into trouble uh, by making sure I'm actually referring to data when I'm talking about whether an insecticide works or not. So there was this one through arthropod management tests, I have a tutorial uh, on the YouTubes on how to navigate navigate this journal because it is open access, very simple, short uh, articles on insecticide efficacy. Highly recommend them if you're trying to determine whether a certain insecticide is going to be considered effective against a particular pest or not. So, anyways, there's uh, there aren't too many studies again because the Coryopsis beetle is considered a relatively new uh, problem. Uh, there's not a whole lot of insecticide trials on it, so you have to look at things that are somewhat similar. So in this case, the Colorado potato beetle, and this was done on potatoes, so we have to look at the insecticides they use here and translate it to the horticultural industry. Right? So they have different trade names, but a lot of the active ingredients will be quite similar. So based on this particular study here, uh, there are three main ones that seem to work quite well. One is cyanotranilaprol, or in our industry is often known as mainspring. We have spinosad and some kind of non-ionic surfactant used together, and or abamectin. Uh, so those are just three. That's just some examples, at least out of this study, of, of things that work uh, pretty well. And another thing I want to bring up real briefly was, oh, does anyone know what this is? So this is the roots of a plant. I think the real Kevin definitely knows. Did I have I muted everyone now, or is everyone self muted? 
Yeah, yeah. No. So root not nematodes for sure. So, you know, I think some of the above symptoms you start sorry. Twenty points to Becky. Twenty Aloy points to, was that Becky who said that? Was it the real Becky or Aloidagyne fat females? That's what that word means. Aloidagyne. It's the genus name for root not nematode. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Twenty five points, Becky. Well done. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you, uh, some of the above ground symptoms you'd see is things like what you see uh, starting to wilt and you see a plant that's not growing very vigorously, probably dying. Uh, always looking at the roots helps. I think most of the nursery growers I talk to when they see problems with their plants, they look at the roots anyways. So you, know, you start seeing these nodules and start seeing these knots in here, usually, usually dealing with root knot nematodes. Is there anything else that could give this type of symptomology? Yes. Oh, what is that? Oh, you want answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said yes. So presumably you have an idea of something else that could show that, that symptomology. Yeah. So so just just on the watch out, a lot of people often uh, mistaken uh, uh, rhizobium nodules for root knot nematode damage. Now, rhizobium nodules are on, on legumes. Uh, usually you see that. Although what's been interesting is if you have been in a typically heavy clay, wet type soils, I've seen those type of nodules form on non-legume plants as well. Not, not in, in terms of the numbers, but a few of them there uh, are popping up. So there, there was apparently some interaction before. So sometimes that can be mistaken for, for the root knot. Now that's a simple way to, to, to figure out between those two. Push on the knot. If the knot peels and roll off, it's rhizobium. If it does not, it is probably root knot. Uh, and I believe in some cases, damage as well as uh, uh, both physical and some chemical can cause those swellings as well. Back to you, Erfan. Very nice. And that was basically it. I mean, those are the two main issues that kind of came up in this last week and I want to discuss. Okay. You can uh, take the power back away from me. Okay. Is the real is the real Becky Grubbs ready or is the real El I'm ready. ready? As long as everybody can hear me now, which I think can. Yes, we can hear yes. you now. Yes, we can hear you. And, okay. and by the way, where did Maybe. you, uh, how did you, what did you do to keep your hair look so professional? I mean, did you, you know. Uh, I brushed it this week. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily brush it every day right now with everything going on, but I did decide to brush it today. So. <laughs> really, you don't just sometimes wear a hat instead or. <laughs> I just kind of wad it up in a bun and just tie it off. Um, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about addressing soil issues this time of year um, and cultivation practices. And I'll talk about it more generally, but also, of course, within the context of turf, because uh, turf can be one of the more challenging systems to cultivate because of that continuous uh, coverage of vegetation. So um, I did want to kind of refresh that um, compaction is a really common concern in a lot of our Texas landscapes. It can occur as a function of a lot of different things. Um, one, one reason that we may see uh, issues with compaction is a lot of our native soil can be very heavy in shrinking, swelling clays. This creates a lot of issues over time with soil structure. And we'll also talk a little bit about the impact of water quality on that as well. Uh, and then of course, the way our lawns are often constructed during the home builder process um, can create a lot of uh, challenges for you as a landscaper coming into a new landscape. Uh, I know many of you are kind of in, in that industry. And so, um, you know, what we'll see is they remove a lot of the, the good topsoil at the top. Uh, they drive over it with a bunch of heavy equipment. Sometimes they'll bury a bunch of trash and debris in there uh, just for good measure. Uh, and then we end up with a, a very compacted soil and a builder option for a creates a lot of issues. So um, what we'll see when compaction is an issue is we'll kind of see some thinning out bayas. You'll see uh, trees will have a compromised growth. We'll kind of see these perpetual symptoms of nutrient deficiency a lot of times. And so we want to think about if we're potentially seeing signs of compaction, 
which can also include areas where water is cooling and not infiltrating well, um, excessive runoff. Uh, you'll also see certain types of weeds tend to favor compacted soils like dandelion, goosegrass, uh, yellow wood sorrel, or oxalis. Um, so if we're seeing a lot of those things, then we may need to consider a cultivation practice. So of course, for your exposed areas, you know, con conventional tilling practices are always an option. Uh, and you can take advantage of that as an opportunity to also incorporate uh, natural soil amendments. So you can look at, you know, high quality compost materials can significantly improve soil structure for both very heavy clays and heavy sands. So um, they'll improve uh, the structure of those soils as well as nutrient and water holding capacity. Um, in the case of clays, when they improve the structure, they'll also uh, potentially improve uh, infiltration rates as well. For a turf crop system, um, typically for alleviating soil compaction, we're going to be looking at aerification or aeration, which are sometimes two terms that are used interchangeably. And, um, you know, as we move kind of into this next month and we get closer to May, it's a really good time to think about doing this in landscapes where you suspect uh, compaction is, is creating issues and, and kind of keeping you from producing the best quality turf possible. Um, so, you know, uh, I get a lot of questions like, what's the best cultivation practice for me to think about? Um, so what I typically tell people is with most of our soils, our native soils that have a little bit more clay in them, you're typically going to get more benefit from doing a hollow time or a core aerification uh, where you're physically pulling plugs, removing plugs from the soil. Um, the spikes or the solid time aerification that some people may be more familiar with, you might get some benefit from doing that on a more sand-based root zone, um, but we just, in, in a lot of studies, have not seen uh, as much um, impact of that practice on a heavier clay soil. So I would recommend looking at a core aeration or core aerification practice. Now, you can find anything from, you know, something kind of like this, a little walk-behind air fryer that, that probably goes about two to four inches into the soil. Uh, you can change the times out for, you know, different diameters or different spacings, um, you know, depending on the type of turf you're dealing with. So, St. Augustine, I may want something that's got wider spacing um, than if I'm dealing with something that's finer. Because if I use something too fine, for example, on St. Augustine, where my, my times are very close together, um, I might get almost kind of tangled in that turf and rip it up without meaning to. So um, you can also, if compaction is really significant, you can look at uh, deep time or shockwave. We've got a lot of new equipment. So deep time or shockwave aerifiers that are going to have a, a deeper impact on the soil. Of course, whatever you do, you're going to want to make sure that you're mindful of irrigation lines. You know what's buried in that landscape and you don't create a, a problem accidentally. Um, again, look at potentially incorporating um, compost material. Even when you aerify, you can uh, top dress with a mixture of like a, a sand material and a compost material um, afterwards. Um, so, you know, th this practice, I would say we typically recommend it for this time of year because turf is actively growing as we go into May. Um, it's actively growing, but we haven't hit our peak heat yet. And so it's easier typically for the turf to recover uh, from these practices in the late spring, early summer. It uh, doesn't mean that you can't get away with it sometimes at other points in the season, but if you're looking for quick recovery from the turf, um, we're, we're moving into the best time of year to do this. Um, also a good time to think about leveling or, um, you know, evening out areas where you've got low-lying spots. Um, any areas where we have water pooling, they're going to be more susceptible to disease issues and things like that. So we want to do what we can to correct those issues. And again, this is a good time of year because we can uh, top dress and kind of level that area out and the turf will be actively able to grow through it. Um, so these are just a few tools. I talk about them with homeowners. Some of you um, professionals already know what these are, but I will go through them real quick. So this one in the uh, top left hand here is a level on. That's going to be probably about $135 on average. You can go with a standard landscape rake, um, or you can top dress and then use a drag mat to kind of even uh, surface areas out. Um, a little bit because I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
water quality, and then I'm going to touch briefly on. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that can significantly affect our soil quality here throughout Texas is poor water quality. Um, water and college station, for example, is, uh, tends to be very high in sodium and bicarbonate. We have several other parts of the state that are similar. Additionally, if you're working in a landscape where they're using well water, a retention pond, or reclaimed water, um, there can be an increased likelihood that you're dealing with water that's high in salt. Um, when sodium in particular hits our clay soils over and over again, we get this dispersion of the soil and it can we lose the, the structure and quality of that soil over time with repeated use of these water sources. And so that's gonna affect how well our plants can root into that soil, how, how well water can infiltrate into that soil. And so that may be something that we need to uh, address as well. And this is something that may be commonly overlooked if you're not used to dealing with water quality issues. So um, if you suspect that this might be an issue or if you know an alternative water source is being used, uh, you might recommend uh, a water test and you can get that performed through, through our AgriLife soil testing uh, lab with Tony Proven. Um, so you can get a, a water test performed, learn a little bit more about the water. Um, you have a few different options for kind of combating salinity issues in the landscape. So you can make recommendations for more salt tolerant plant material. Um, and if you're not sure, you know, what that looks like, you know, feel free to contact. I think any one of us here can make some good recommendations. Um, you are going to want to uh, explore the possibility of using rainwater to supplement the irrigation water and whether or not your client is open to that or that's an option. Um, you can look at using gypsum as an amendment, particularly when sodium is the issue. Um, and you know what I would recommend is again, testing soil water, working with the soil testing lab to confirm that gypsum is the right fit and you know, working with them to help coordinate your rates. Uh, and then of course, again, uh, compost and organic materials can be really beneficial. So um, those are a couple of big things I wanted to talk about. And then um, this time of year, I get a lot of questions about fast management in turf. So I'll kind of talk about that just more generally here for a second and say, um, you know, there are three main ways that, or four main ways that we typically manage fast in turf grass systems. Um, the first is going to be spring scalping. And this is a practice that we typically recommend for Bermuda and Zoysia, because those grasses are soliniferous as well as rhizomatous, meaning they're able to tolerate a low mowing and recover, okay? So St. Augustine grass, on the other hand, is only soliniferous and only produces above ground lateral stems. So if we cut too, you know, cut, cut too much of that off, we can do significant injury uh, to St. Augustine and not have good recovery. So um, spring scalping, we typically might recommend doing this um, right around spring green up. Different literature sources have different recommendations. So some suggest just prior to spring green up after the, the risk of late season frost, some suggest um, just after spring green up. Okay. Um, and just removing a lot of that debris. And then um, other options for controlling fast are of course going to be verticutting, uh, vertical mowing, which can be performed again, right around the same time as air fine, uh, late spring, early summer, when turf is actively growing and able to recover. Um, core irrigation will remove and help control thatch as well. And then the final practice is going to be top dressing uh with a you know good top dressing material sand material um as we cover the thatch layer in that it helps to increase um, microbial degradation of the thatch and helps to break it down so um so those are some things to think about um typically thatch is going to be the biggest issue in zoysia lawns so if you work in zoysia lawns it's something you definitely want to monitor um very common for me to see a zoysia lawn look great for about two years and then begin to decline. And it's usually because it is not being cultivated. Um, so just some things to think about as it relates to cultivation. And that's all I've got. You can take away my power. Okay, I'm gonna give it uh, to Yankee. You ready? Yankee? 
He's still muted. Muted. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Young Key. Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> can you see my slide? Not yet. Hey Mang Mong, can you can me can you send the the approval to uh, show my slide? Yes, hold on. Go ahead. You're the uh, presenter now. Okay. Yes. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Just show the couple slide that I can I like to show. Let me see. I have three slides. So. So bad, uh, you know, bad. Uh, the oh, bad oh. thing was the uh, bad thing was the uh, uh, the coronavirus thing is that cancel a lot of uh, egg hunting events uh, in town and and community. So usually I go to you know several places, several day uh, egg hunting event. But this year's we don't have it, unfortunately. The good thing was uh, we can set up the egg hunting in my backyard so there's no competitor uh, for my daughter to hunt the eggs. So as you see here that the grass is, uh, I mean, I'm not very well maintained in my backyard, but they start to clean up. Can you see the, uh, the figure here? Uh, this one is uh, is a kind of same yard, but is uh, you can see those uh, uh, kind of dead spot there. And actually, it's very commonly occur uh, if you use the herbicide that you bought uh, from the Home Depot or Lowe's. So the interesting is uh, uh, those are a lot of uh, herbicide which is mixed with a lot of good stuff in there and yeah it killed the wheat but also it killed your grasses and particularly this is the St. Allison grasses so uh, <clears throat> a lot of those uh, you know the very strong and multiple active ingredient in there are uh, uh, we can ac accessible and we can buy cheap but uh, make sure that you uh, uh, those herbicide has to be applied uh, before the green up. So at this point, it's, it's too late. So you can use those, uh, uh, you know, multiple chemical mixed uh, products you can buy uh, from the uh, local garden store, which is they're going to kill the kill the turf grass as well as the weed. And so. Those are only supposed to use uh, before the turf grass uh, green up. Okay, so it's a typical. Hopefully, my my yard can be recovered from the the herbicide damage, and uh, and so it can be happen. Anybody uh, that think is ready uh, for you know weed control at this point, and make sure to check the label. Uh, you know, is a safe for the the grasses you have, say an awesome grass, the meter grass or zoysia grass. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, fairy wing. And so uh, temperatures go up and we've got rain. You see, you start to seeing the uh, fairy wing start to popping up. And the fairy wing, actually you can see it here. I showed this one last time, but I didn't talk uh, talk much, but the, it you can see the darker green kind of circular type it's uh i mean you cannot see the mushroom right now uh actually the the fungus is still active and then they and then actually decompose organic matter and which uh which kind of produced extra nutrition uh, back to soil so the grass is a lot greener than the other one so and for uh, 
or remediate those kind of faring uh, unevenness uh, because of that. I and some of the things you can do is you can apply some uh, some granular fertilizer uh, around uh, where those are kind of a little darker, uh, so that you can kind of masking those uh, darker symptom. <clears throat> and and then if it's a mushroom popping up, you're just mowing up, that's not a big deal. The really, the problem is uh, in this area where those uh, mycelium growing is, can be very, uh, can be a problematic when it's the summer's coming, middle of summer, we have a lot of uh, uh, kind of dry, uh, dry seasons come, no rain a couple of weeks or, or, you know, four or five weeks. And these areas can be, uh, can be drought stress uh, faster than the around area. So at that point, these areas can be little brownish color. Their wilting symptoms show up at first rather than the other area. So uh, the easy thing is you can, you probably hand water the area has infected where there's a ferrine can be uh, growing there. So you can remediate uh, some uh, drought stress around uh, ferry. And in particular, we not uh, recommended uh, for fungicide use uh, for homeowner or residential uh, to control the ferry wing. So uh, just uh, you know the, best, the easiest thing is you can you can put some extra water uh, to make the plants are uh, you know avoid the drought stress. That's kind of a uh, thing. But if you are in a more professional field, really you want to maintain the grasses uniform and, and healthy throughout the drought hot season in the summer, you really uh, get your uh, fungicide program started now to uh, knock down the fun uh, you know, fungi activity around the, the infected area. I think that's, that's all I have today. Thank you, Yankee. Next, Kevin Ong. Kevin, let's see, what do you have? Okay, hang on. I think I have to do something. Because yes, can you, you see do my have screen? To do something. We all have to do something. No, can you see my screen? Nope. Not yet. Oh, gee. Stop putting your screen in front of the camera. Uh, yeah, the just share your screen. Real funny, I think I have to give it permission <laughs> or something. Hang on. It's uh, the top, it's at the top, sharing. So be nice. It's at the top, sharing. So System, I have to go to security and what am I? Oh, are you on a Mac? Okay. Are you on a Mac? This would oh, be cool. Yeah. yeah, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, so the first time you okay, do I it, see. it's gonna ask you like your permission. You might have to actually reset as well. Oh, not your computer, but, that, but you might have to like click and rejoin. I don't want to do that. Then, then, then Meng Meng is gonna lock me out. Anyway, it's let possible. me. Well, yeah. Uh, hey. If, yeah, let me. I, I'm gonna come back to you and then let me do it. It just sent me like a little pop-up permission prompt. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can do that. Um. In the meantime, Erfan, do you remember that that photos that you sent me that I thought was sudden light? Yes. You might want to pull that up just in case I cannot get in. All right. I shall and, uh, you want me to make Erfan the uh, the presenter so that he could share uh, show us the pictures? Actually, hang why on. Why don't, why don't we? I mean, you want well. Or is the yeah, real Kevin Ong still going to try? Kevin. Okay, I'm going to hit quit now. If 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 it gets me kicked out, I'm going to come back right in. So, Airfun. Okay. So, Airfun, go ahead, show us the photo that uh, Kevin was talking about. All righty. Oh. Let me get rid of that. Hang on. Hang Ooh, that's on. Let's go there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is what he was talking about. This mountain range looks like southern blight. Yeah, <laughs> 
All right, so this was uh, a sage plant. I'm gonna make sure there's no identifying features in these photos. Thank you, um, can you hear sage me? Plant. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you, here we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, you probably, you probably have that permission now again. We can't see you right cool. now though. Oh wait, hang I'm on. I'm just, uh, I don't, I'm still showing them these pictures. I don't know if you want me to show them these pictures and then. Excellent, show them that pictures, that looks great. What I want you guys to take a look at is look at that middle picture and let that etch into your brain and then once you do that all right how do i get uh, uh mama make me uh, uh, uh let me uh, share screen everyone's Everyone etched that into their brain now i got do no, i need to give, to give it to you okay. okay i think you're muted mama I just gave it back to Kevin. Okay, let's see. It says show my screen. Let's go. To oh this. my goodness. Uh, oh. All right, beautiful. So, so guess what you saw there when 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 Erfan sent me that picture. I said, boy, that looked like sudden blight, uh, sclerotium rossi. Uh, what you see on the image is actually one is out in an onion field. So typically, you get that that mycelia. You get that white looking balls and then eventually it'll turn a little bit brown. So it almost looked like osmoco. It's not very common that you find this in nurseries and, 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 and potted plants and all that, but it has happened before. Um, you know, how did it get there? Who knows, probably the mix had some sort of mulch or, or, or soil that's contaminated. This is actually a picture of, of sclerotia on a, on a, a juga. And, and, and so if you get this in a potted plant in your production system, like again, I said, it's, it's really rare. Uh, you pick up a few of this, isolate those plants, think about getting rid of it. That's probably the best way to deal with it. But if you actually are dealing with, let's say, contaminated, uh, contaminated soil material, there is unfortunately no good solution uh, to stop this fungus. Now, folks that have grown tomatoes before and, 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 and some of the peppers with this is a problem, they have used and, and actually um, reported that they are getting some, some uh, protection on, on, on plants when they use heritage that sprayed up against uh, the uh, stem of the plant. I don't have any data on that at all, on, on ornamentals or woody ornamentals in a nursery type situation. So just keep that at the back of it, your head. I, I will still say this is not very often something that you would see in a nursery type production situation. If you do, pull out those, those, those pots and get rid of them. All right, uh, let's see, what else do I have on this part? What Kevin, so what are, so what are some of the characteristic features there? Is it kind of those little nodules, little balls there that you see? Yes. So uh, let's see if I have a. See, I don't have a lot of good pictures on ornamentals that uh, on that. And um, let's. Kevin, while you're looking for the yes. pictures, I'm gonna let the audience so know that, that, that at the end of your presentation, I'm gonna unmute all of them so that they could ask uh, questions. So let's let's be a real chat. Okay. Thank you. So. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so I have some really cool pictures of this on on a on on pumpkin. So if you notice on on the image, you see that white ball. Those are, uh, uh, are the uh, sclerotia trying to form. And then as you go further back, you notice those almost like uh, uh, yellowish brown balls. So it is really uh, like a mini osmocote or, or slow release granule uh, um, um, type in appearance. Now, a second thing that, that could be happening in the greenhouse right now, this is usually the time of the year uh, that it happens when you get cooler temperatures uh, and we see this uh, worse in greenhouse than 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 in in, in nursery type situation. Let's see. Let's see if I got some pictures. And it is uh, pretty much in that that same um, group. Oh, I did not want to do that. Why did it do that? Oh, there we go. 
So this is Snapdragons. Um, um, one of the things is they will produce sclerotia as well, and they will have that white looking appearance. This is actually uh, what it looked like on lettuce. But when uh, this was actually a submission on train, we get this, I say every other year from somebody in the nursery industry uh, with, with, with the question, why is the plant looking like it's melting out? And if you look closer at it, well, this is not in focus. Let's see one that's in focus. Um, the sclerotia, instead of nice round and brown, it looks like rat poop. And instead of sclerotia, this is sclerotinia, sometimes also known as white mold. So if you go in into the morning into the greenhouse where it's really moist and temperatures are mild, I would say about 55, 65 or so, and then it's been hot during the day and then cool off at night again and, 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 and you get a lot of moisture in there and you see this white looking stuff, take a closer look and it, look, if it looks like there's rat poop on it. That's the problem, uh, uh, sclerotinia. Uh, there are some, some fungicides that you can use uh, uh, on this, but most of the time those fungicides are gonna be uh, 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 preventing infection on, on new plants rather than, than trying to take care of uh, or, or remediate uh, as a curative on plants that have already been infected. So do keep that in mind. Let's see, what else do I have? Um, now, oh, also something recent. Um, how do I change my screen? Screen, main screen. All right, so now hopefully y'all would see this tray of salvia. This was a picture that was sent to me this week and, uh, um, and it's, this is a situation that is occurring in, in the greenhouse, uh, North Texas, Central Texas, when we are getting temperatures that are cooler, you know, that's going from cool and then hot and then cool. And so what you do get in a greenhouse, if you keep humidity in the greenhouse, you get a lot of condensation. But what's happening with this salvia here is a disease called downy mildew. Um, uh, let's see if I can, uh, enlarge this a little bit but you guys see some of the damage so this is pretty far along in a sense that the leaves have already died and turned brown but when it starts you would tend to get uh, uh, symptoms that are more like what i have in the center right here uh, just chlorotic and sometimes we'll have purple tinges oh this is a good one right here uh, and sort of it's just that off color and, and, and sometimes almost look like it is uh, contained within the veins. So um, the downy mildew, that's a piranospora, that's a water mole. So you know, materials that you could use to, to take care of uh, Phytophthora pythium, things like Mephinoxum subdue, uh, should work on this. Uh, Elliot, the phos uh, phosphoric acid types material would also have activity on, on uh, uh, this type of issues. So that's for greenhouse and nursery type issues. Let's go to and let's show you some pictures of slime mold. So this past few weeks, I would say probably the last six weeks or so, We've been getting a, a slime mold uh, pictures and asking, what's this, what's that? Well, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Goo, uh, last week we showed you some cool blue stuff. And I'm gonna show you my collection, at least of some of the uh, pictures of slime mold uh, that we have had over the years. This is another one that is a blue one uh, that I got this year growing on the mulch. Uh, but did you know, they are cool looking ones that looks like sausages on a stick or you might say corn dog looking in a bunch and this is a, 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 a staminitis which is one of the other slime mold this is on the edge of a, a, a leaf i actually got a picture of one that was really big blob on a window that was sent to me by uh, dr mike merchant there in dallas let's see so that's brown this is yellow uh, this is actually in my garden, and uh, we had some fun with that one. And 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 just for a fun experiment, if you guys are bored during this uh, shelter-in-place uh, stuff, or your kids are, if you find an active one that's still uh, in the plasmodial stage, take a hose, uh, drag a line, 
and 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 soak a piece of wood um and then you know run a, a a wet wet area sort of like make sort of a wet water road going to that stick and it and 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 what happens is over a day or two you'll see that blob moving to the stick and if you take that stick let's say a two by one and knock it in the ground or even a one by one knock it in the ground and just keep the top wet you might actually get a slime mold lollipop i haven't tried that yet and when next time i do and successful i'm going to take a picture because it looks really cool it really looks like a lollipop the the thing that we do have to put there is do not lick it i take it um, you don't have a dog no so air fun <laughs> you do have a dog do not do this because i don't know what it does to the dog or you could <laughs> let us know in a couple of weeks this is another one that we found out in 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 my yard and this is i would say creamy salmon and so this is another one uh, uh that that we find pretty commonly and if you notice what it does is it it just grows over the grass and so in some sense this was saint augustine you know it it actually competes against the grass for for sunlight and and you get uh um dead grass eventually and so if if after a while that slime mold get washed away or disappears what you get is round little patches of sickly looking or dead grass, just very much like if you take some newspaper and throw it on your yard, St. Augustine yard, or put a pile of mulch and clear it out, you know, a week later, what do you get? Yellow grass or bear patch. Let's see what other colors do I get. Oh, this was a cool one. That's a red one. Red one is eh, pretty common too, but there are so many different slime molds that are red in color. Uh, uh, just to point out the red stuff there is, is, is Kind of colonizing the leaves uh, uh, and so on. And, and, and by the way, we do not, again, typically see this in like a greenhouse situation, um, you know, potted uh, uh, production situation. It, if you do, it probably came in with mulch and you're probably using some, some mulch product. Um, nothing to be worried about on that part. Uh, if you catch it early, just take a, a hose and, and, and spray it off and uh, uh, uh that is not gonna hurt the plant for a long time oh that's another red one and that's uh my foot let's see what else do we have on this one kevin where's my blue one kevin where's my blue one um that was somewhere i don't know not in this slight set but i'll pull that up oh that's right i almost oh just one more thing if the slime mold uh and and most of the slime molds when when they mature and when when they actually get hard, it looks like dried vomit on the thing and you break them apart. Notice the dark area in the middle? That are, uh, those are spores. Uh, so pretty much when you see it this way, it's not gonna move anymore. It's, it's past the primordial stage. So uh, this is where you just enjoy it as a patty. You can pick it up, throw it at someone. Sometimes if it's dried hard enough, it actually hurts. Other time it just disintegrates. Oh, and this was the one that we have gotten uh, several pictures uh, from different people uh, in the past uh, week or so. This is a different type of slime mold, but if you take a closer look, it looks like a mushroom or sometimes some people think of it as uh, multiple phallic structures. Nonetheless, that is a slime mold. Um, white and black. Oh, this was a cool one. This was taken many years ago, but this was uh, one of my test plots, and, and that's a rose one. And this slime mold actually climbed up onto a stem and, and basically smothered the leaves on that stem. Um, this is also one of the reasons why my wife doesn't like me in her garden, because she said, what do I do about this? I said, well, that's cool. Let's wait and see what it does. And uh, so that's what it does. Did it really kill the plant? No, it did not. It just, uh, um, it makes it look pretty cool for a pathologist. Um, I realize in, in a nursery production system, this is probably not sellable, but I always think, you know, if you market it the right way, you could, you know, biological science project or whatever. Uh, but it, it, one of those things, and when that, that slime mold dry off, you can easily knock it off. 
So, all right. So let's see the slime mold that uh, uh, Dr. Goo passed on to me last week. So I had some fun with that because one of the newest piece of equipment that I have is a scanning electron microscope, an environmental scanning electron microscope. So, so what I do with those things is take the sample, stick it in this machine and be able to look at it uh, in a very, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, be able to, to blow it up um, uh, pretty high. So let's see what I have. So this are some of the pictures that I took last week of the slime mold, which I believe after looking at it and, and through some structures, it's from the genus Bethamia. And, and, and by the way, this is just fun stuff for you guys. Um, so this is, uh, let's see if we can get down to about 850 times magnification. Uh-oh, did I break it? No, I didn't. So everything that you see on the right side, those those little looking things, that's that's really supposed to be more spherical, but in 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 the vacuum that we pull in the SEM, it, it basically crumbles down. But those are the spores. So if you think back of that picture that I showed uh, much earlier about one of the yellow ones, that black area in the middle, that's it. And let's see if I do have another picture of those. Oh, that's just a picture of where it's next to a leaf. So. Uh, what you see there that looks like lips, that's the stomata of the of the uh, 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 grass. Uh, I think just for uh, reference, uh, that 100 micrometers is 1 512th of an inch, in case anyone was wondering. So that's what's really cool about that scanning electron microscope. So you can see really, really small things. Uh, let me see if I can find another cool one. All right, so this is uh, at about 70 times uh, enlarged, you know, so so uh, 500 microns. What's that air fun? You're the calculator. So that in, more in fractions that, of an inch, I'll, I'll have to find out for you here. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep going. Needless to say, it's really, really small. So each one of those globs, you know, with, with a scanning electron microscope, it's black and white. So just imagine this to be blue and anything that's crack in there is gonna be black. And so those are, are the shape of that slime mold that's on the grass uh, uh, leaf. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool tool to have, to, to have some fun with and to look at things. Um, that's, that's just a little less than 1 64ths of an inch. So. It and is, it's, I mean, it's not given color because it, it basically takes a photo by shooting part like uh, electrons, right? It's, it's shooting guys, magnetized I'm particles. Guys, you're getting too geeky here. I'm gonna have to stop <laughs> yeah. you there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, some of you guys out there that that is in the landscape uh, uh, um, business know that I work with uh, uh, Rose Rosette. So. For those of you that have fun with Rose Rosette, just want to show you a picture of the aerophyte mites and the eggs. And this is one of those that I took a while back from a sample out of the, the, the Houston area. So Rose Rosette uh, is a virus transmitted by the aerophyte mite. And um, uh, this is about what do we call the 65X on the high vacuum. Uh, let's see if we have a picture of the uh, mite itself. So, you know, when things are small, you often forget that they are there. So the scanning electron microscope gives us to put a face on, on, on the thing that 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 either carries the, the the pathogen or causes the damage. So this is a pretty picture of uh, Phylocoptus fructifolus, which is the aerophyte mite, uh, which is implicated as the uh, uh, vector for rose rosette. And when you look at it right now, don't you think they are pretty? So anyway, that, that's all I got. And uh, uh, throw your questions my way. We'll see what comes next week. And I realize, guys, out there, uh, there's a lot of challenges with uh, the COVID-19 situation. Um, I, I feel bad for a lot of you guys because I realize it, the, the market out there is, is, is high, very tough, especially for producers uh, uh, with the plants and, and, and um, you know, trying to get folks to plant more at a time where it's, it's, it's tough, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy. So I applaud you guys who are still out there hacking away at it. Hopefully, uh, you know, we can continue to do our jobs and make sure that you have the information 
uh, uh, to help with past pathogen and also culture when you do need them. So thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna unmute all the attendees, uh, but uh, you know, restrain yourself uh, a little bit.